China is the biggest enigma of our time. The Western media would have us believe uh, that she is autocratic, uh, manipulative, overcontrolled, and shorn of civil liberties, amongst many other accusations, right? But we live in Asia where China dominates. Many of us have traveled to China. Some of us have done business in China. Some of us still do business in China. And for better or for worse, we recognize and understand some, at least some of the values that the Chinese government appears to espouse. Okay. Plus, we can see that the Chinese economic miracle has been nothing short of remarkable, and it's real. Okay. But because of our proximity to us in ASEAN, and uh, you know, we will be affected in some way, shape, or form if the Americans do decide to pick a fight with China. So the question is, which side should Malaysia take? How do we maneuver? How do we turn? So one viewpoint comes from a gentleman named Lo Wei Hong. Now Wei Hong, I've spent many an hour with him. He's an, he's an educator, an investor, an entrepreneur. He spent many decades in China uh, doing all those things over there. And he's got a few interesting viewpoints, which I hope he will share with you today. And so dear viewers, uh, here's my conversation with Lo Wei Hong. So Wei Hong, I, I, um, I'd like to start off the discussion with the fact that um, China is really the enigma of our times. Um, you know, we've grown up on basically uh, the last few decades have been on American civilizations, American dominance, the West, and we do a lot of business and we are very familiar with the ways of the West. But emergingly in the last, you know, 10, 20 years, China has really, you know, taken the world by storm. And I think it's pertinent for us to understand China a lot better since we are in this part of the world, right? And so, so as we come into the era of this new so-called new world order and, you know, China's growing dominance in the region, economically speaking, politically speaking, even in the ways of China and the, the new social strictures of China, right? It's important that we understand it better. And who better to speak with on China than someone like yourself? And I'll let you introduce yourself because... Um, I understand you, you, you've worked there, yes. you've taught there, you've mm -hmm. got children there, you spend a lot, a lot of your time there. So to the extent that you can tell us about how you know China and what you, how people should understand about how you're familiar with China. All right. Maybe you can start by okay, doing that. Okay, maybe start introduce myself. My name is Lo Wei Hong. Currently, I'm in Malaysia. Uh, the only one thing I need to correct you just how to introduce myself. I do have children in, Malay uh, in China. I got children in Malaysia. That's very important. Okay. So that's important to get. get <laughs> yeah, straight. just kidding. Okay. Um, because I'm a Chinese educated guy, all right, in Malaysia, and I because being a Chinese educated, I'm very fluent in Mandarin, obviously. And um, my first encounter because I'm a I'm a MBA lecturer, all right, and a part time MBA lecturer, and and one day, one of my student in Malaysia, but he got contact in China. You will ask me, will you go to China to lecture? So I said, well, why not? As long as you pay for everything. So I just take a ticket and I fly to China. All right, that was year 2000. That's the first time I stepped foot on China. Year 2000, April, I, I went to Beijing. Then subsequently went to Shenzhen. So since then, I have been back and forth China for the last 20 years. And 10 years ago in 2010, I started my own business in Beijing and Tianjin to teach uh, 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 kindergarten English and get Filipino teachers to teach in China. Uh, why I, I get Filipino teachers? Because that is also, again, is my contact. Because I'm a bilingual lecturer, not only just lecture in Mandarin, but also lecture in English. So I also, I get a chance to lecture in the region. I went to Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, you know, to lecture and also went to Canada to lecture. So. So that gave me a lot of chance to see what's happening in the region overall. I got an overall picture. And then furthermore, it has been a long time. 20 years is a long time, you see. So I can see how things change and how things being developed over the last 20 over years. When I first stepped foot to China in year 2000, in April, if you knew me by then, you probably asked me, hey, Wei Hong, how is China? My description to you probably is one word, backward. Poor, backward, Poor. right? Yeah. Okay. In fact, year 2000, when I went to Shenzhen, when I crossed the road, I don't need to look at cars one. Why? Because there are no cars on the Bicycles road. Bicycles at the time, <laughs> yeah, right? Bicycle. Yeah, bicycle. No cars on the road. I just crossed. You see? But shortly after that, 
2001, 2002, you can start seeing traffic jam in Shenzhen already. So they develop very, very fast. So from year 2000 onward, because I keep on going back. In fact, because I'm, I'm, I'm not attached to any institutions, I'm a freelancer. So I got a chance to travel into many cities in China to teach MBA. Because MBA was introduced to China in the year 1999. So shortly after that, I managed to get into China to start teaching. Reason because they just don't have enough experienced lecturer to teach MBA then. Okay? Because it's 20 years. So I got a chance to went to a lot of cities to, to teach, to lecture. So I got a chance to visit a lot of cities in China. The northern part to Harbin, to the uh, west, south, southwest in, in Kunming, and to the northwest to Lanzhou. I mean, I've been to many cities. And that, that, that may give me a chance to see how China developed. What should people know about China? Because when we read about China, we typically read Wall Street Journal, CNN, even South China Morning Post, um, Straits Times Singapore, Bloomberg, you know, your typical Financial Times and all that, right? Increasingly, uh, Wei Hong, in the last few years, I've been noticing the type of reporting, unfortunately, has become skewed, okay? And skewed is a polite word on my behalf. Lah, huh? it, it's, it's, uh, it is not as nuanced and as balanced as I would like. So I, I, I think this is quite disturbing because for me, these are tier one media, okay? And if the Financial Times is not as nuanced as I want it to be, to me, that's a problem. So then I, talk, I try and dig a bit more. Talk to people like yourself who spend time there. So what should people know about China? Okay, I, I will say a few words to describe China. The first word I will introduce is called hardworking. All right. Chinese people are superly hardworking. You see, I also lecture in, in this region. Okay. Just share with you some of their my students' behavior. Because that's that the group of students that I, 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 I contact the most. All my students are business people. Because only business people working read, crowd, yeah. Working crowd and businessmen. Because only these people will study MBA. I'm, I'm an MBA lecturer. You see, even I lecture in Myanmar, Thailand, you know the Philippines or the Vietnam, the moment I say, okay, or even Malaysia, okay, okay, class finished, we are done today. Then I start, pick up my things, collect my, put, put, put my notebook, everything in the back. The moment I put, put on my head, the whole class is empty. Every student gone home. But in China, for every classes, I almost guarantee, the moment I say, okay, class finished, definitely there will be a few students come and approach me. Prof, are you free tonight? Can we bring you out for dinner? When they bring me out for dinner, it's not just for free food per se. Actually, they want to learn more. They start asking me questions about what I taught in the class or what, what, what kind of experience I had, you know? Or, or sometimes they even ask me their personal business issues, you see? So this is what the Chinese students are all about. They are very, very hardworking. They, are, they, they work very, very hard. That is why China can rise so fast for the last 40 over years. Actually, there's no secret. In fact, I use one sentence to describe China. China's economic reformation started in 1978. To be precise, it's December. This is where Deng Xiaoping announced that we would like to have economic reformation. Okay? During the time in 1978, China is in hardcore poverty. When I say hardcore poverty, this is what I describe. Majority of the Chinese people can't even fill up themselves. All right? Can't Maj feed themselves. They can't feed themselves. They're, they're in, in, in uh, semi-starvation, majority of the Chinese. Second, majority of the Chinese maybe got one or two clothes at home. That's it. Third, none of them got any TV, washing machine, whatever whatsoever in their house that was in 1978 the worst thing many houses don't even have toilet <laughs> i'm serious that is 1978 so a country that don't even have a proper toilet in 1978 in 30 40 years this country can build a space station up there okay i want to ask you to give some more granularity right Wei Hong? Because um, it's not just the Chinese that are hardworking. I mean, when you go to Vietnam, right? Vietnam is a homogenous country of 80, 90 million people. 
they all look bloody hard. I've been there, first hand experience, 20 years ago I went there, right? I went there and I got to, I can't remember, I think it was Hui or Huian in, at, at 5.30 in the afternoon. These kids come up to me, say, sir, 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 you want to build, you want to make a suit? I said, how much is the suit? Oh, 10 US dollars. I said, fine. Okay. Let me go and put my bags down and I come out. No, no, no. You come now. You come now. They literally dragged me into the shop, right? Wait, I'm, I'm not kidding you. 5.30, they dragged me into the shop. The woman took my measurements. 5.30, 5.45, done. Okay. Later on, I went back to my room, came out. I could hear the, you know, the sewing machine. 10.30 at night, still going. Ding, 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 ding. So I asked her, what time should I come for my fitting? Oh, tomorrow morning, 7.30 a.m. I'm like, huh? So they work through the bloody night. It's not just... So what I'm trying to say is there are hardworking people all around the world, right? What is the difference? Is it the, is, okay. is it the government that is, that is the difference? Okay. Uh, just sidetrack a bit. Just to talk about Vietnam. Uh, mm. I, can get, I can tell you one thing. Today, the Vietnam government policy is 100% copied from China. They copy everything. Communism, right? No, 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 communism. The, the economic policy. Okay, so since you brought this Because thing, it's a very centralized, yeah, you know, yeah. authoritarian government, right? Since, since you brought this thing, then I come to the second word to describe China. Economic policy. Okay? You see, in 1978, November, Deng Xiaoping actually came to Southeast Asia. They visited Malaysia. They met up with Hu Xin'an. Then subsequently, he went to Singapore to meet up Li Kuan Yew. And actually, for those who are interested, can actually get it from Li Kuan Yew Memorial, the, the two books that Li Kuan Yew written. Inside that is spelled very clearly. Deng Xiaoping was absolutely shocked what he had seen in Singapore because he asked Li Kuan Yew to bring him to one of the normal family households in Singapore, the HDB flat that we, we Malaysian know, know very well. When he stepped into the HDB flat, she, he was surprised to see color TV, washing machine, okay, and refrigerator, a fridge in the house and a phone that was 1978 and he was stunned Deng Xiaoping because in China even a country leader like Deng Xiaoping himself don't enjoy such a welfare can you imagine huh? a country leader Deng Xiaoping don't enjoy such a welfare so after that of course he talked to Li Kuan Yew and Li Kuan Yew gave him a very blunt advice open up your economy open up and then since then Deng Xiaoping actually sent a lot of government officers went to Singapore and learned from Singapore. So a lot of things the Chinese government implement now actually is learning from the Singapore government. Open up economic policy. Okay, that's first thing. Second thing, when Deng Xiaoping, why Deng Xiaoping actually uh, 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 cut out a few special zones? Because in 1978, the Chinese people, in terms of the ideology, they are still very, very, very central economy. All right, communism. Con communism not supposed to talk about money. The moment you talk about money, is capitalist, and capitalist is bad. All right, Shut because that's the ideology. Shut you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what happened is Deng Xiaoping trying to change the mindset. That's why he set up a special zone called Shenzhen, Shenzhen Economic Special Zone, in 1980. And in this economic special zone. He tell the mayor, okay, we, China central government, got no money. So please don't ask any money from the government. We don't have money. But I can give you policy. So he cut out the special zone, Shenzhen economic zone. Inside this Shenzhen economic zone, you can do anything you want. I give you the policy, give you the liberation, give you the freedom to do whatever you want. So this economic special zone is a testing ground. Whatever policy works, the rest of the country will copy and, and duplicate back to their hometown. Whatever not working in Shenzhen, cut it off, you know, throw it away. For example, Shenzhen, okay, in the very beginning, do something very simple. They rule the Hong Kong because Hong Kong businessmen are the first group of people set up plan in Shenzhen. All right? And during the time, they call everything very simple. Only. You bring everything here, we do assembly for you, OEM. Okay? Put in your brand, you export. So Shenzhen become a, a hub for Hong Kong people to move their plan because everything is cheap. Ma. Labor is cheap, labor is abundant. So from there, then the rest of the Chinese provincial, pro, 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 province 
start copying the same model. Then that is what we saw, economic policy. And Vietnam copied exactly the same. And since then, China started out a lot of economic zone. In many, many provinces, tax-free, la, land is cheap, la, whatever, whatever. And Vietnam copied exactly the same. Five economic zones in Vietnam, the policy is identical with the Chinese one. So economic policy is very important. And China learned from Japan, Korea, all right, what we call export-led growth. You see, China is looking at themselves, all right, okay? We got the land. Land is abundant. We got labor. Labor is even more abundant, okay? So these are the economic advantage that we have. But we lack of technology. We lack of capital, okay? We don't have these two. So what should we do? Very simple. I cut out uh, a, a simple a piece of land, big piece of land, okay? Whoever want to come, I give you cheap land. You start a plant here, I give you five plus three plus two. This is what they call, all right? Five years, free tax, tax-free, okay? Until you make profit, then we only start taxing you. But even you, let's say, uh, five years you're making losses, the sixth year you're making profit, we still tax you, but we give you 50% discount for three years, okay? Then after that, we give you an additional two years, three plus two. Then the 10 year, we will tax you fully. Sounds like that pioneer tax that Malaysia gave to foreigners under the multimedia super corridor. Correct. Oh, correct. Way back, right? Yeah. But, but okay, so, so the Chinese economic miracle is well settled. Huh? Everybody knows how well they've done, okay? But increasingly, because we are, there's not so much in the limelight, that, that there's many other things that people should also know about China. Okay? For, for example, the way they handle Hong Kong, the way, the way they handle Tibet, the way they handle Nepal. So, I mean, quite concerning. And then, of course, the West likes to make a big deal out of the, out of the Uyghurs, right, in, in that part of the world and the treatment of the, you know, the Muslim settlers over there. So, that's one thing on the human rights side, okay? So, well, then the other thing is, a couple of years ago, when they clamped down the technology companies, very unexpectedly, right, um, caught everybody by surprise, right? All the big companies, Pindodo, Alibaba, Tencent, all got whacked for the way they were running the business. So the way Chinese government approaches the economy, the way China approaches people, is very different from, from how we are used to in the West. So it's judged and disturbed a lot of people. So how concerned should we be about these things? Okay, talk about this side of the, of, of, of the other side of the story. You see, the Chinese government, they do things at speed, okay? See, because they can, quite in contrast to say India, India is a democracy, so yes, to speak, right? And yes, they have got to see, get consensus so, of everybody. So China, the moment they say one policy, do it, they'll just do it. Full steam. Full steam. For example, last year, zero COVID policy for the last three years. Okay, no other country can do it except China. PCR test, go for it. Everyone go for it. In Malaysia, whoa. Let's you talk about COVID up. because COVID is a big issue, okay? Yeah. Okay, but but just, but just in terms of how 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 what should we be concerned about? Okay, you see, to to me is this: you always have to remember the third word I want to say about China. First one I talk about hardworking. Second one is economic policy, right? Third is aggressive. Chinese government and also the Chinese people they are very aggressive. The moment they set a target, they go for it. Okay, can you imagine ah, two o o seven. They only got one line from Tianjin to Beijing, the high-speed rail. Okay? 10 years today, sorry, 15 years today, they already connected all the major city with high-speed rail in 15 years. Okay, so Wei Hong, infrastructure I can understand. Train, train connectivity I can understand. But with Hong Kong, okay, they have until 2049 to, I think, 2047. 20, 20, 20, 20, right? So 20 years before that happened, they really start to pull in already. What's okay, going on? You see, Hong Kong is a different issue. Hong Kong is a different issue. Can they not be trusted? I, th I think this is my question. Uh, no, actually it's a different way. Um, you see, first of all, Hong Kong is a different issue. Okay, Hong Kong... What happened in Hong Kong is because Hong Kong are facing a very poor economic growth for the last 25 years. Hong Kong? Yes. A lot of people will be very surprised. Okay. Okay. One of the reasons because Hong Kong housing 
it's just too expensive. Now the young people in Hong Kong almost giving up hope to buy a house. In Hong Kong, if you want to buy a 600 square feet apartment, you're looking at 2 million Hong Kong dollars to start with. Just imagine, uh, if this is in Malaysia, how many of us can buy a house more than 1 million, a fresh graduate? Hong Kong's house prices are a result of their success, right? No. Actually, the problem in Hong Kong is the economic structure. Hong Kong actually is being controlled by oligopoly. A few families actually control Hong Kong, including the housing development. Yeah. Because Hong Kong is practicing what we call a free market enterprise, okay? Uh, 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 very Western style. Uh. Very Western style, all right? And the Hong Kong government itself is a very small government, okay? So because of that, for the last 60 years, Hong Kong, the the rich and the poor, the polarization is is very serious. The rich getting very, very rich and the poor is getting very, very poor. The, 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 that is extreme, all right? And Hong Kong government failed to balance it up. In 1997, actually, the first special zone uh, 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 chief, uh, Dong Jianhua, he would like to introduce what Singapore have done, HDB flag. Okay? But it was being struck out by the rich people. You know, the few rich family. Okay? That is one of the main reasons why the young people feel very frustrated and that they put the blame on China because they see how China grow but Hong Kong actually did not grow as much as they wished for the last 25 years. So this is one of the very important things. You see, like in Singapore, all right, in Singapore, almost every Singaporean own a house. But in Hong Kong, hardly any young people own a house. That I... is that is one of the biggest frustration. And one more thing, second thing is Despite Hong Kong is next to Shenzhen, all right, many people didn't realize that Shenzhen GDP just overtake Hong Kong last few years. Size of economy. Econo economy. Size of GDP. Yes. Size, yeah, size the of output. Of GDP, like, yeah. Okay. And Hong Kong only got financial center. All right. Even the film industry already perished and, 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 and almost destroyed. But Shenzhen managed to transform themselves, become a technology center. A lot of people didn't realize that. For example, Tencent was there. All right. DJ, Da Jiang, the, 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 DJI. The, 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 the drone, the drone. DJI, DJI. Uh, DJI yeah. drone was there. Okay. Uh, BYD. Okay. The, the latest uh, car, BYD, Buffett, just introduced Buffett in Malaysia. In, yeah. the, the, the EV car is in, is in Shenzhen. Of which Buffett Huawei, is an investment. Huawei yeah. is also in Shenzhen. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Shenzhen now actually is a technology city. A lot of people didn't realize that. Okay, but bear in mind, forty years ago, Shenzhen copied everything from Hong Kong. So, so okay. So, my I want to know about Hong Kong is it used to be twenty to thirty percent of the Chinese economy. Today, there will no more than three or four percent, two percent. Okay. Yep. They, okay. In nineteen ninety seven, when Hong Kong returned back to China, Hong Kong was twenty five percent of China, China economy. Today, two percent. Two percent. So you're saying what China is doing in Hong Kong is actually good for Hong Kong. Okay. At the expense of the people and of so-called social and human rights. Actually, for the last 20 years, right, Chinese government really give free hand to the Hong Kong people to run their own show. And China feels that they haven't done a good job? Yes, because it, Hong Kong is not growing. But that you did a problem. deal. You did a deal to give them 50 more years, yeah, right? Uh, and another 30 years. La, but, from but, now, la, right? Yeah. yeah. But you see, Hong Kong, at the end of the day, what... What is actually at the end of the day today, the Hong Kong people are facing is is a economic issue, but it turned out to become a social issue. Okay, so people don't realize that sitting outside of Hong Kong, they think it's this and that, and yeah. yeah. And the third one is you see, uh, the owner of DG Da Jiang, uh, he's a graduate from Hong Kong Science Technology University. When he got this idea about drone, when his master project is actually doing a drone, drone, okay, all right. And the time when he went around the whole Hong Kong look for investment banker and venture capitalists to, to invest his technology, nobody want to invest on him. So he got no choice. He went to China in Shenzhen and people start putting money into him and he developed what he becomes today. What I'm trying to tell you is Hong Kong also missed out a big opportunity in the technology development for the last 20 over years. So Hong Kong today, it, it is an economic issue and 
turning into a social issue. Misinterpreted as a social issue. Because they, a, everything, actually, at the end of the day, is economic issue. When you got no food to eat, people will go uprising. That is quite, quite um, a normal case. Look at Arab Spring that happened in 2010. If you look at it carefully, it all started because take a poverty issue. Yeah, it's the divide, rich and poor. Yes. So it's quite clear that you're quite pro-China, lah, Wei Hong. I, I'm, I'm, as, I'm trying to be as neutral I, as I can. I, right? I would not say I'm pro-China. I just look at facts. Okay, I understand. Yeah. So I am trying to be as neutral as possible. Yes. I'm trying to see it for what it is, right? But then when you look at what, what they've done in, in say, Nepal or, or Tibet, right? Uh, Way no, back no. When. Nepal, Nepal, they didn't do anything. Nepal is an independent country. Okay, uh, uh, Nepal yeah. is an independent country. It's not, it doesn't belong to China. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and Tibet as well, right? Well, Tibet is not an independent country. Correct. Tibet is part of China. But it's so-called disputed, right? Well, it's not disputed. It's not even a dispute. Because Tibet has been part of China for the last 500 years. So, it's not a dispute. Okay. It's just, it's just the West is making it up. Make, making it up. It's not a dispute. Okay? Tibet, Xinjiang is always part of China. Since three, four hundred years ago, it's part of China. So the suspicion is that the West is envious of China, of and course. they have this, you know, this machine. Okay. Have you heard of this theory called Ducidity Trap? Yeah, I think you've mentioned that to me before. Yes, yeah. you see, Ducidity Trap is a is 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 a is a very good theory to explain what is happening today. You see, why we never heard so much about China twenty years ago? Why the Western media didn't cover so much about China twenty years ago? I educated in, from the West. I, I'm a Canadian graduate. Okay? So that's why I also read Economist, Financial Times, CNN, you know? And I agree with you. For the last five, five to ten years, I can see Western media stuck. type of reporting is... Is skewed to, to another another way. Hmm. Alright? They, they failed to mention some of the key points. You see? Tibet has been part of China for 500 years. Xinjiang has been part of China for 500 years. So, you, you get my point. Well, two wrongs don't make a right. The way the Americans treated the black slaves, well, the, you know, the slaves. Exactly. Does, okay. not, if, if, does if, not invalidate see, the way China if, treated... If, if today, 1861, is happening in 1961, if the South is going to declare independent, do you think America would have civil war? Sure. Exactly. Absolutely. So exactly. it's part calling the cap. There's a lot of hypocrisy involved. Of, uh, of course. Of what course. about the Kashmir region where they are, you know... The, uh, ah, this is a controversial part. Correct, with because, India. Because, see, draw the line, that's where the, the dispute of the border, lah, yeah. you know? Yeah. But you see, China... In 1961, China actually had a war with India. And China actually keep on winning the war. And that's why President Nehru resigned. Because President Nehru resigned in 1961. Okay? But the Prime Minister Nehru, not President, Prime Minister Nehru resigned in 1961. But even though China crossed the border, but after they saw that they have really defeated the Indian army, they withdraw back to the same border. And the West never mentioned about it. Okay. okay? And now China and India got an understanding. That's why they don't, when they patrol the place, they don't use gun anymore. That's why the last two years, there's some fighting. You know how they fight or not? Feast. <laughs> <laughs> no They're way. They're not using gun. Okay, yeah. Okay. They don't use There's gun. There's not a lot of reporting on that region, so Correct. I can't find information. Correct. You yeah. know, they're using fist fight. Yeah. You know, the Chinese soldier and Indian, Indian soldier having fist fight. So, Why? Because they knew the moment you carry gun, problem. you definitely were going to use it. Yeah. The moment you're going to use it, it will escalate. Yeah. Whoever yeah. fire the first shot, it will escalate. Okay, so come to the current point, Taiwan. Okay. Now, a lot of these so-called defense analysts, they expect something to happen by 2025. No, okay. it will happen. Okay, why? First of all, if you look at it very carefully, China at this moment still don't have enough power to take back China, to take back Taiwan. China military force is not good enough to take back Taiwan. This because world, Taiwan is strong or because no, China because is because Taiwan strong? is an island. Chinese army, the navy is not strong enough to take back Taiwan for the moment. The West never report this. So the intention is there. The resources are not. Okay, is that what you're saying? Put it this way. Taiwan 
it is part of China. Because we have to look back the history. All right. In 1946 to 1949, there was a civil war between Kuomintang and Communist Party. All right. Communists won the civil war. And Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of Kuomintang, ran to Taiwan. Okay. But during that time, China is China. It's under the Republic of China. Okay. The only thing is this. In 1949, October 1st, Mao Zedong, the leader of Communist Party, declared a new name for China called People's Republic of China. Taiwan is Republic of China. Mao Zedong, uh, 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 Beijing is called People's Republic of China. But if you go back to history, you ask Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong, is this two China or one China? They will tell you it's one China. But if you want to talk about history, you go further back, right? There are Spanish influences in oh, Taiwan. Oh, okay. You, There's you Japanese look at, look at influences that, uh, in Taiwan. No, 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 not, not Spanish. It's, it's Holland. Dutch actually uh, 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 took Taiwan in 400 years ago. But before that, Taiwan is part of China. So, Netherlands conquered Taiwan. But for a short while only. Because after that, they were being, being beaten by the Ming Dynasty rebel. So right. come, come, come back to us, right, in ASEAN. What do we need to do to prepare ourselves for the next, say, five to ten years where China is clearly emerging and America is clearly uh, decelerating? Okay? okay. This is a good question that I would like How to How do address. we prepare for this future? Okay, two things. One, go back to history again. Go and study King Chula Long Kong. Why I brought up this thing? Thailand. Thailand. You see, if you look at the whole Southeast Asia, there's only one country has not been colonized before. Thailand. Thailand. Who did it? Why Thailand didn't being colonized by the British and the French? Well, one school of thought is that both sides, the British and the French, needed a neutral party in between them to stay neutral so that they can keep at and, bay. And who came out with the idea? King Chula Long Kong. He went to talk to the British and also the French. He brokered the deal, Correct. thereby staying neutral, yeah. like Switzerland in the process. Correct. Okay. So this is a very important lesson that I think the whole ASEAN country leaders should learn from King Chula Long Kong. That's very important. Yeah, but you assume that ASEAN is going to be unified. ASEAN has not even been able to organize a <laughs> party uh, in a discord. Okay, put it this way. There's 13 uh, countries and they've been fragmented for well, as much. Yes. But no, at least ASEAN is still intact since 1967 until now. All right, they didn't break away. In fact, because of ASEAN United, we managed to get the ASEP deal being sealed up. ASEP idea, regional comprehensive economic po policy, uh, 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 policy, is actually started, initiated by the ASEAN country. Correct, but nothing material or meaningful has come as a result yet. Yes. Uh, until 2018, when China realized that ASEP is very important, because before that, they tried to get China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and India together. Okay. All right, and ASEAN are driving it. Okay. But they didn't really progress very far until 2018 when China realized that actually ASEP is very important and China gave a support to ASEAN. Immediately, December 2018, the ASEP deal is sealed. Only thing is, actually, it's quite sad. India, 11 hour up, up from ASEP. It, actually, the, the, the foreign minister, the finance minister already in Bangkok. They're about to sign the deal. Half an hour before they sign the deal, India break away from ASEP. Actually, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a, a big a, deal. A, 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 yeah, a, a big. setback for, for, for mm -hmm. India. But never mind. But ASEP, is a very important free trade agreement for the East Asian country. A lot of people didn't realize that because the RCEP, it makes us become one unity market that we can export our things a lot more easier between the countries. And this is very important for Malaysia being a very important trade country. Just like the European Union with Germany being the biggest beneficiary, I understand. Yes. Um, but but I want to ask you, right, Wei Hong, because you suggested that 
China will not attack Taiwan, not because it wants economic peace and stability in the region, it's because their army is not strong enough. So you are suggesting that when, they are, when and if their army is strong enough, the Navy, they will do so? Inevitably. China and Taiwan will, will, will reunite in one day. But we don't know when. Fair means of how? La. We don't know when. Okay. All so right. one way it, or another... It could be a peace, peaceful unification. We don't know. We do not know. But okay. inevitably, inevitably, one day, it will reunite. Because you have to look at China history again. Bear in mind, China is a very old civilization. And this is the only civilization in the world never get disrupted. It dated all the way back to 7,000 years. You know, like today, the Taiji, you see, you know, the Taiji diagram, mm. okay? It dated back about 7,000 years. And it never disrupted for the last 7,000 years. And unification is always the mainstream thought about China. That is about China. So, inevitably, one day, Taiwan will return back to China. We do not know when. But not what the American military suggested 2025. I can tell you straight to the face, today, America wants to have a war with China. It wants to. It cannot afford though. Can no, it? they want to. But they want it? Taiwan to. They want China to attack Taiwan and they knew China cannot take. They cannot. Okay. Just like Russia and Ukraine. One year ago, if you ask me, will Russia win the Ukraine war? My answer to you, definitely. Sure. Russia is such a big country. Ukraine is such a small country. Compare size lah. Ukraine is still bigger than Malaysia, for instance. Yeah. All right. But after 11 months, what happened to Ukraine? They're still fighting, you know. Mm. And Russia is not winning. Mm. And this model, this is what the US wants to replicate this model to Taiwan. Why does the US want to fight with uh, China? Why does US want China to attack Taiwan? Go back to Ducidity Trap again. Okay, you see, U.S. never bothered about Ch China until 2011, when Obama started pivot to Asia. You remember, all right, and then in 2014 he started another call TPP, Trans Pacific Partnership. And if you look at Trans Pacific Partnership, is 12 countries, including Malaysia, but they purposely excluded, excluded China. China. Because they want to use the 12 countries to contain China. Why? Because, you see, uh, why 2011? Very important. 2010 is the first time China GDP overtaken the Ameri the Japan. Japan is about 5 trillion and that's the first time China GDP overtaken Japan. 5 trillion in 2010. So China is second largest economy in the world. Immediately, U.S. pick up the signal that we can we have to do something to China, and Obama started TPP. Twenty sixteen, when Trump came into power, he used a different strategy. All right, he pulled American out of TPP. That's why Japan want the TPP to stay along, so he they 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 stay intact. They call it CPTPP, Comprehensive Progressive Trans Pacific Partnership, and luckily. In uh, November last year, Malaysia also joined CPTPP. Officially, we, we joined CPTPP. All right? That is also very significant to Malaysia because we are ASEAN member, CPTPP member and ASEAN member. So it's very significant to Malaysia. But that's a different <coughs> topic. All right. Now, Trump started to have trade war with China in 2018, March. Okay? <coughs> Why? Because they want to, what they call, they call decoupling from China. Okay? Because China is the manufacturing hub of the world. They basically manufacture everything. And Americans found that, no, we do not want to do that. But they started with trade war. But Trump actually made a mistake on trade war, all right? Because things didn't move the way Trump wants. After four years, it proven. The trade war is a, is a silly mistake. But never, never mind, 2020, Biden came to power. Biden actually escalated the war. From trade war, it become technology war. And now Biden wants to go all out to block China 
to develop chips, semiconductor. That's why last year, why Nancy Pelosi came to Asia, visited four countries, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and, well, sorry, Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, and Malaysia. Why Malaysia? Why she doesn't go to Thailand, Indonesia, or, or, or you know, which is, or Japan, which is much bigger economy than Malaysia? Why he came to Malaysia? Because Malaysia is the fifth largest semiconductor center in the world. So Americans are going all out to block, and look what happened now. McCarthy, the new speaker of the house, just become a speaker. First thing he said, March, you want to visit Taiwan. Why? Big problem. China is going to be very angsty about that. That is what they want. Yeah. So if you say when China invades Taiwan, right, Wei Hong, does America rescue Taiwan? Yes. How? They will not send the um, they, they will use exactly the same thing like what they did to Ukraine. NATO. They will they in fact now Americans are trying to okay, just now second the third talk about Biden. Trade trade war continue, technology war, the third one is military alliance. They 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 form quad. Quad is India, Japan, so, Australia, Australia, and, Japan. and US. US. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then after that, they, they, they form AKUS, Australia, UK, and US. Mm. If you look at the whole map, they want they want everything just to contain China. And then now they want Taiwan to increase their military budget. They want Japan to increase their military budget. And Japan has done so in the yes, last few Japan years. Yes, Japan already has done it. Yeah. Okay. The third one now is Korea. They want Korea to increase their military budget. They want to use the Ukraine model. What, what did Ukraine do? You see, Europe, Euro or NATO did not send a single soldier to, to Ukraine. But what did they provide? Arms. Weapons. Weapon, yeah. The, most, the latest weapon. Yeah. The latest is tanks. Mm. Germany are, are providing tanks to the Ukraine. So they will do the precisely the same thing to Taiwan. They want, they, you see, why, you see, by using Ukraine war, it weakened two parties. That is what Americans like it. They weaken Russia. It's very clear cut. Actually, the, another party they weaken is Euro. Okay. But anyway, uh, we, we skip that part. Come back to this. So, if you look at this, this, this about, about China, how we actually deal with China. The first one is learn from Chula Long Kong. Right. Second, very important. We have to learn how to dance with dragon. Mm, both sides. Yes. You see, we have to learn the history of China. A lot of us actually do not know Chinese history. A lot of us have no idea how China actually rise up. A lot of people have no idea how China was being humiliated over the last 150 years. A lot of people didn't know that. 100 years ago, this time, 1900, eight countries invaded Beijing. Okay, The eight country is still superpower today, except Austria, Hungary already dissolved, but replaced by Canada. The remain are in, still intact. The same parties. It's the same yeah. parties. So the eight countries for the last 100 years have been influencing and controlling the world, including the media. And now they call a new world order comprised China, Russia, right? The two biggest parties, yeah. which obviously America wants to destabilize. La. Yes, definitely. Because see what happened is, U.S. feel the threat from China. Is the, see, the... For, you see, uh, U.S. became superpower or GDP overtaken the British Empire in 1894. Since then, US has always the number one in terms of GDP okay, in the world. Even like Japan, Germany, and Russia, or Soviet Union by then, challenged the, the leadership of the American. But the GDP never exceeded 60% of US GDP. But today, 2022, China GDP is 78% of US GDP. And not only that, if you use PPP, purchasing power parity, in 21.5, China GDP actually exceeded the American. So it makes American become very insecure. I use the word called today what? Paranoid. Today, America has become very paranoid about China. They're so worried about China. Everything they worry about China now. And to the point that, I think it's becoming irrational does the us dollar have enough strength to engineer this because as a country the country itself is very weak it, it's no longer what it used to be but they are using the dollar's re global reserve currency status to to help okay. itself in a at, lot at of this ways moment, is it strong enough or not it's not better or strong enough it's matter whether we have a substitute or not 
And my answer to you is no. Currently, no, yeah. we don't have any substitute for American dollar. There was supposed to be a spe- special drawing rights, right? Well, Basket of four currencies, uh, the UN is about 30%. That, 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 is, that is academic. La. That is yeah. academic. But in reality, we have to, we have to, um, we have to be very r- realistic. Let's look at the economy. Uh. Number one economy is US. Number two economy is China. Number three economy is Euro. Okay, if the 25 country Euro put together, they're the third largest economy in the world. These three economy, China renminbi is not freely exchanged. So you can rule, rule China renminbi out. Okay, and China will not open up their capital market. That is why America are very frustrated. They cannot engineer what they engineered in 1997 on East Asia economy. All right. Okay. Second, euro. Euro itself is weak. Euro is not growing for the last 20 years. That's why euro is weak. And euro itself cannot withstand, you know, uh, 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 to become a global currency. All right. So at the end of the day, we still have to fall back to the, um, the US dollar. That's why I say US dollar is not a matter of strong. We don't have any substitute for the moment. So you, okay, so in summation, right, China's is growing strength, uh, you think it's going to invade Taiwan, the dollar will remain as it is, as the global reserve currency, and it does want to engineer this uh, instability in the region to destabilize China and to destabilize Russia, like what is done in the Ukraine. As Malaysians, right, with businesses and with investments, how do we position? Where okay. do you invest for the next you 10 see, years? Let, let, let me share with you. Malaysia actually got one of the most distinct advantage that we enjoy, which is considered one and only one in the world. I think a lot of our audience actually didn't realize Malaysia is the only country, listen carefully, the only country in the whole world, also of China, got Chinese education system. Is that right? Huh? I didn't yes. Realize. No other what country. About, what about in Singapore? No, Singapore, they don't study Mandarin. Mandarin is only one subject of their syllabus. Their whole syllabus is English. That's why Singaporean English is much better than Malaysian, obviously. Because they're, 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 that's why when the Singaporean go to US to study, they don't need to sit for TOEFL or else. Because the country recognizes them as the mother tongue. Okay. But not Mandarin. Because they don't have Mandarin. Only one subject in their school. That's about it. That's why a lot of people misconception. Oh, Singapore got speak Mandarin. Yes. Two thousand people speak Mandarin in Singapore. Malaysian migrate to Singapore. Or Johorian work in Singapore. And what we call new immigrant from China. The China, mainland Chinese who migrate to Singapore. Because in Singapore, they got a lot of mainland Chinese my, my, my immigrant. Okay. So, so it makes Malaysia got a distinct advantage. Because you why? Well, in, in what way does Malaysia have a Chinese education system? Yes, I am a I'm a product of Chinese education. Chinese school. Chinese school. But it's the SPM, it's the national syllabus. It yeah, but but, ki- but but we got another independent school. That is the, U, no, the UEC. Yes, there's no other country has it, but Malaysia got it. For example, like my son go to China to study using UEC, UEC result, and they recognize it. My 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 son goes to Zhejiang University, ranked third in China. So you do have children in China, or you will soon have children in China. Ayan, my, 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 my children study in China. Okay, okay. Not, not having a family in China. It's two <laughs> se- separate issues. No, just kidding. Okay, just kidding. All right, no, come back. You see, that's what a lot of people didn't know. Okay, for example, why I can lecture in China for 20 years? I'm a very good example. It's the product of Malaysia education system. Because we got Chinese primary school. Okay, I studied in Chinese primary school. I studied in Catholic high school, which is a national school. The only thing is, Ch- Catholic high school is very strong in Mandarin. All right. Of course, obviously, because the other thing is, I also got interest in Mandarin. That's why I can speak very well. I can write very well. And this gives me an, an avan- advantage to lecture in China. And I educated in, in Canada. So give me advantage or speak a very fluent English. So I also know that the Chinese diaspora, which happened two, three hundred years ago, the biggest footprint of the Chinese diaspora is in Malaysia. I think we've got six or seven million Chinese in Malaysia. Biggest, bigger than any other in the world. Uh, no, Even not, then. not necessarily. You're talking about Chinese descendant. No, uh, Chinese diaspora. 
They landed in the Philippines, they landed in the Singapore, they Actually, landed in Thailand. Thailand got more. Thailand got nine, 9 million. And Indonesia got 8 million. Malaysia okay. got 6 million. One, one of the biggest, right? Yeah, well, yeah so, one so, of the biggest. So what I'm trying to understand is, does China leave Malaysia alone? How does China view Malaysia? As oh, an ally or as, an, as a foe? Oh, they treat Malaysia very important. Two things. One, geographical issue. Strategic location. Yes, because... They can just take 85% it. 85% of Chinese product ship via Strait of Malacca. If they wanted to, they can just walk in and take the country, right? No, cannot. Right. China will not do that. Why not? If China want to do that, they have done, done it in in the 16th century, uh, for, uh, 14th century, during the Cheng Ho's time. Cheng Ho Emerald at that time, you know how big is the ship? Huge. 20,000 soldiers yeah. alone. Okay? What is the population of Malacca at the time? A few thousand? 20,000 versus a few thousand? Why does it not take it? Why does it this allow? This is not a Chinese tradition. You see, a lot of people have forgotten one thing. Chinese culture per se is not aggressive. They don't go around colonize people. But yet, a lot of but people, yet it wants to expand eastwards and westwards. Well, they are, they are not military. It's not military. They are not expanding. China never had a war for the last 40 years. The last war they had was with Vietnam in 1979. And since then, they stopped. They're not having any war. In fact, when they had war with Vietnam, they won the war, they crossed the border, but once they, the thing is fin enough, they withdraw back to the border. They didn't take an inch from Vietnam. That is China. A lot of people didn't realize that. You see, for example, today America got 750 military base around the world. China only got one, which is in the Horn of Africa. That's it. All right. Americans spend 800 billion US dollar on military budget. China is only about 200 billion. And yet, US say China is a threat to the world peace. Don't you think it's a bit Do you think those numbers are accurate? Sorry? Do you think those numbers are accurate? Okay, given I what, we know, it up. I given it what up. we know about the South China Sea and those islands which you're now sprouting up with what look like bases there. Okay. Right? Talk about the nine dodges line. That's right. If you go to Taiwan, look at their map. Taiwan also nine dodges line, but why nobody talk about it? Why no Western media talk about Taiwan? Their map, they also got nine dodges line on it. Actually, a lot of people didn't know the history. The nine dodges line was being drawn by the Chinese government in 1946 with the assistance by the United States government. That's the part that nobody mentioned about it. The nine dodges line was being drawn by the Chinese government in 1946, which already gone to Taiwan in 1949. But why, why nobody mentioned about that? It's because Taiwan is weak. Now people start digging out to talk about all this. It's only got one reason. They feel China is a threat. That's why they dig out all the excuses to talk about it. And furthermore, in 1946, which country is independent in Southeast Asia except Philippines? Philippines declared independent in 1945. The rest, Vietnam, um, Malaya, Okay, uh, Indonesia, we are not even a country yet at the time. And the Nine Daughters Line already being driven. The only problem is after 949, China shut down the door, right? Closed door. And this, all these countries start independent, they start drawing their line. And this is where all the controversial started. Okay, let's move on to one of the biggest issues lah, huh? the COVID uh, policy in China. Yes. Very weird. Okay, this zero COVID policy. Now, we have talked about this before yes. on other occasions and you have said it's actually not a health issue, it's more of a face issue. Okay. It's more of a power grab issue. Okay, right? you see, China view, China got a very different view on major issue. Okay, they want stability out of everything. Stability is their number one priority. Because a lot of people cannot imagine the population of China we talk about 1.4 billion. To you, it's a number. But let me put it in context. When I go to China, you know how I lecture them? I tell them about Malaysia. Our population in Malaysia is 30 million. It's only equivalent to one city called Beijing. And our GDP, our GDP, okay, is only equivalent to one city called Shenzhen. That's it. That's Malaysia. Guys, think about it. 30 million is only equivalent to one city in China. 
Okay. For example, because I stay in Beijing for five years, every day they got 10 million Beijing resident taking subway. Every day, 10 million. And the whole Klang rally that we got from Klang to KL, we only got 7 million people. So just imagine the numbers. So to China, stability is number one issue. Okay. Of course, second thing is, last year we are touching one very sensitive ground. Xi Jinping want to continue to his third term. Unprecedented. Uh, since Deng Xiaoping time. Mm. So, to be fair, he got a lot of resistance internally. So he wanted to make sure that things work out his way. So he implement the zero COVID policy. However, if you if you notice, by end of November, there's one thing called white paper movement. Happened. What happened? Because when you do a like Malaysia MCO, people feel a lot of economic hardship. Okay? So a lot of businesses actually went bankrupt in China during the last one, two years, during the zero COVID policy time. So a lot of people cannot take it anymore. They came out to show white paper. What do you mean by white paper? I got nothing more to say. That is what white paper, white paper all about. All right? And see what happened to the Chinese government? End of November, they got white paper movement. It sent a short wave to the top. All right? They realized that the Chinese people are superly unhappy. December 3rd, they removed all restrictions. And January 8th, they open up the economy now. Now you and me can go to Chinese embassy, apply visa, buy a ticket. Tomorrow we can be in Beijing and have a cup of tea already, if you wanted to. So what I'm trying to tell you is this. Chinese government, they re react very fast to the market and they look at the things and they try to correct things in a very fast way. There's something that, unlike a lot of countries call Western democracy politician, we like to talk. You Consensus see? based. China, just do it. You see, for example, Malaysia is the Malaysia and Singapore is the first two countries top a high speed railway data back ten years ago. All right, and today we still talk about. Sorry, we stop talking about it, and now we try to <laughs> restart the negotiation. Yeah, yeah. All right, China already built a high speed railway from Kuming to Vientiane in Laos, and now Thailand government saw the opportunity, they are very, very eager to connect the line from Vientiane to Thailand, to Bangkok, which means Kunming in Yunnan can take a high-speed rail, go to Thailand in no time. And we are still talking about, should we start the negotiation of a high-speed rail? So just see that you can see the differences. Well, the dream is Bangkok, Bangkok, KL, KL, Singapore. Lah. Then Correct. you connect the whole region. Correct. Actually, if, if you look at Southeast Asia... tailor made for high-speed rail. There should be a few by now already. Yeah. In fact, Southeast Asia, a lot of people didn't realise that. Malaysia got the best infrastructure in Southeast Asia. Besides Singapore. But I never count Singapore. Because Singapore is a city-state. Alright? If you take Singapore in, then I will take KL in. I think KL infrastructure is so quite good. Fantastic. Uh, except Fantastic. for public transport. We still need time to improve it. Alright? To be fair. Singapore public transport is much, much better than KL. But anyway... So, come back to this, all right? Southeast Asia, because I, I, I managed to read lecture in the region, I can see Southeast Asia lack of infrastructure, their lack of highway, their lack of power. You see, like today, when you talk about Vietnam, despite Vietnam is, is very gung-ho, the economy is growing leaps and bounds and strong and, and, and very, very, very good. And yet, every factory, backyard, they put a, a, a generator. generator. Yeah. Why? Because... They always got power failure in Vietnam. They've got a bite from Laos, haven't they? <laughs> right. So, Vietnam, actually Southeast Asia with 700 million people, we desperately need infrastructure. We need good roads. We need highways. We need high-speed rail. And that is what China are good at. Well, China wants to do that with the BRI. So, they want to come in and fund the whole thing. And uh... Well, actually, a lot of people have, have forgotten one thing. In, in fact, why China can grow so fast? That's a, another one I want to introduce is the infrastructure. You'll be very surprised how fast they do things. The moment they connect things, the moment you got roads, the moment you got high speed rail, everything moves. 
Let me share with you one joke. Because my father born in China, so I still got relative in China. In, oh, okay, in, okay. In, in, in hometown, okay, in in Hakka, Mui Zhao, ah, Mei Zhou. Oh, Hakka. Hakka, Hakka, right. So year two thousand, I first time went back to China to visit my father hometown in a kampong, really kampong, because we need to ride motorbike. No road is bad road, and then finally I reached to my my father's kampong house where he born. Okay, I got relative there. Okay, I of course they welcome me, and then we sit down, and I still can speak Hakka, we speak Hakka, and then you know, very simple. After you drink a few bottle of water, the next thing you want to do is go to the loo lah. <laughs> so I just mentioned, ah, uh, by the way, where is the washroom? Uh? it's a it's a simple word. Uh. Like here, I say, where is the washroom? Oh yeah yeah yeah, outside you turn left, turn right, it's there. So the moment I mentioned, hey, where is the washroom? Very casual. The whole family stood up, very casual. Then my 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 elders relative asked me, big or small? I said small. Then you can see that. <sighs> then they asked his eldest son, which is same age with me, bring bring they call me Asok lah, uh, uncle. Bring bring uncle out. I went out the house. Then I realized that they actually don't have toilet. You just have to do it in, do it by nature. <laughs> <laughs> However, few years later I went back. First of all, they got Taos Road. Okay, the moment I reach home, the first thing, my my brother, the one is my 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 so to speak brother lah, told me, oh we got toilet now. Wow. That's the first thing. Few wow. few few years later, then few years later I went back again. The the small road it become a highway. Oh, it's a highway already, and I think the whole span is about twelve years. So, China is a country that, you see, Chinese got one saying. If you want to make a fortune, you make road first because when you you have transportation, a lot of things can be done. That's why China can build the high speed rail so fast because they don't care. Just do it. The this population China. is decreasing, though, huh? Ah, this is another issue. Yeah. Okay. They're quite concerned, right? If you ask me, what is the biggest challenge that China is facing? To me, it's not the the technology war that Americans are doing to them. You know, it's not whatever Western media say. The biggest challenge Chinese are facing today is the aging population, or the young people are not getting married, or the low birth rate. Okay. So far, all the advanced country are facing the same issue. Yes. Okay. Young people do not want to get married. Low birth rate. Okay, and. Aging population. The most obvious one is Japan, all right. Followed by Taiwan. Uh, 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 followed by Korea. Okay. Actually, Singapore is also very serious. Yes. The only thing is we never fe face it because Singapore they keep on. First of all, Singapore is very In, small. Second, import, they keep on yeah. my import people. Yeah. They love Malaysian. They love Malaysian male. Just to let you know. Okay. Yeah. So so why 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 I say this is the biggest challenge for China. Because so far. Even Li Kuan Yew himself admitted, okay. No country has successfully revised the trend. Once the birth rate dropped down to below one point five. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Now China is only one point two. Singapore is zero point eight nine. So it's bad. The refresh uh, rate, lah. You're referring to the birth rate. Yeah, birth uh, rate, lah. The the normal one is two point one. It's a replacing two point one. Yeah. Two point one. You have the population growth. Yeah. Right? Why two point one? Because not zero point one. Because some baby may 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 die early. So mm. the 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 standard is two point one. Below two point one means that your population is decreasing. Two point one children per family. Yeah. Right. Okay. Per per per, per couple per couple per couple. couple. Yeah. yeah. So two point one actually that that is the 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 standard. The functional ratio. Yeah. China like, is one point two. Korea had dropped down to zero point seven six. Singapore dropped down to. Be below below one is zero point something. So this this country is very bad. Korea probably will disappear by nature in another eighty years. According to the Financial Times, by the year twenty fifty, the most populous country in the world will be India. Yeah. The second one will be Nigeria. Yeah. Third, China. By wow. the year twenty fifty. Wow, China would, would would. That's why this is the biggest challenge that China is facing because no one. Like succeeded. In fact, in fact, if you were going to look back Lee Kuan Yew's interview or memo or his book, he admitted one thing. 
he failed on this score. He said, I did everything I can. Give that incentive. They even in Singapore, they even have government matching center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Government pay Social for Social Development you know. Ministry. Okay. <laughs> oh, pay for your matching, you know, give young people together. After that, they realize that the young people are taking advantage because they want free food, free game, free party, everything free. But, but then not having... But the hour children. is terrible. The hour is terrible. You know, nothing happens. So at the end of the day, they call it off. And Lee Kuan Yew admitted he failed. So coming back to this, Chinese population now is facing one of... Not one, is the biggest challenge in history. And this is very hard to solve. Yeah. No other country has managed to reverse no. it. So to, to summarize, right, how do we prepare for this future. Okay. This future where there's, you know, two okay. big bullies in the neighbourhood and there's okay. all these, these changes in the situation. First of all, we we should be trying our best to be stay neutral. Okay? Malaysia yeah. and ASEAN together. Yes, yeah. we have to stay neutral. Alright? And I think so far, ASEAN got a consensus. They try very hard to be staying in neutral. Okay? Because that is the best interest for ASEAN. Alright? Don't take sides. Don't take sides. But second thing, we have to admit, China is ASEAN biggest trading partner, also Malaysia biggest trading partner. All right. So, very simple. To me, it's very simple. If the American want us to take their side, very simple. What kind of interest can we get if we side the American? Don't give don't give us one hundred million to the whole ASEAN like what Biden did to ASEAN leaders last year, July. It was the biggest joke it's in joke, the world, you know. It's a joke, yeah. 10, 100 million divided by 10 countries, every country get 10 million US dollars. You can't even build a port for it. I, right? think, he, I think he should retire already, lah, this Biden. No, the Americans actually are looking down on ASEAN, to be frank. They have no idea what... They have no idea yeah. what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea what they want to do. And they're so far away. And they got nothing to offer. Frankly speaking, they got nothing to offer the Americans. And they ref you see, Trump pulled the American out from TPP is because TPP offer American market. They make American market bigger, wide open. And Trump said, no, we're gonna close down. Mm -hmm. So this is a sign. The moment you try to close down means that you are not confident. You see, the biggest irony now, no. China is knocking door on CPTPP. China said, I want to join CPTPP. When you want to join CPTPP, it means that you want to open the market even bigger. That is the confidence of the country. Mm. That is why I will say that for being a Malaysian and ASEAN, we shouldn't take side, but we have to be very pragmatic. Still doing business with China, have good trade with China, and trade with American. And I can tell you, for the next 10 years, Southeast Asia will gain a lot from this because we are what we talk what we are talking now is supply chain relocation. A lot of Chinese companies, American companies, and Euro companies are moving their plants to Southeast Asia. Yeah. Vietnam is benefiting, Malaysia uh, is benefiting. Um yeah. the I call it the I know Penang is benefiting, they got I think shortage of about 20,000, 15, 20,000 okay, workers. Okay, Batu Kawan is is a is we, we actually I got my student doing a um, uh, 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 construction. They they were jokingly saying that uh, eighty percent of our Malaysia piling piling machine for the housing piling one is in Batu Kawan. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Intel is investing hundred million US yeah. dollar. Yeah. Uh, no no sorry, uh, uh, one billion US dollar in 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 Batu Kawan. Just the piling alone. Is, is a huge amount. Mm. So just imagine. Mm. So Malaysia are having a very distinct advantage at the moment because Chinese, mainland Chinese people, they love Malaysian because they feel at home because we can speak Mandarin and we speak English and they love it. So I know I, okay, so let, let's wrap this up, but I, I want to get your thoughts because we, we do need a competent uh, government, right? And I don't talk normally about politics, you know, on, on the channel. But we, I think we, we should talk about whether we have the competence at the top level to, um, to steer this country in the right direction. Well, we have the unity government. 
with 148 seats. Looks stable. <laughs> it looks stable. So I hope Anwar can stay for long because so far, I think, since he became a Prime Minister in November last year until now, I don't see he has committed any big mistake yet. I think he's doing all the right thing at the moment. And his cabinet, uh, so far, so good. All right. At least never tell us going to drink hot water during the COVID-19. All right. <laughs> well, okay. COVID-19 not this time around. Yeah. So, no. What I mean is the mentality. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, drinking yeah. hot water to prevent COVID-19. Yeah. At least I, I haven't seen any minister having this kind of mentality yet. <laughs> so, hopefully, uh, they are doing the right thing. And hopefully, they will implement a good policy because... Um, we are actually at the window of opportunity now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. The absolutely. supply chain relocation is coming in a big way, in a huge way, and Malaysia should grab this opportunity. Last example I want to draw before I wrap up this. Huh? Yeah. There was a plan. It was actually happening last year from China, making glasses. They invest in Kota Kinabalu, KK, Sabah. All right. Part of their plan, actually, they dig the sand and import back to China because sand is good for making making Buildings, glasses. Yeah. Okay, oh, so okay. silicon, right? Yeah. The other part of the plan, they will actually uh, put in KK. And because it's from China, uh, so they say that they need 1,000 people that can speak Mandarin to work in their plan. Wow. And now they are talking to a few universities already. So the other takeaway from this is learn the language. La. Yes. It's just like in the 80s, la, we learned Japanese. Japanese right? Yeah. It's the same thing. That's why I can tell you Malaysia is the only country with such a system in place, a Chinese school. And we should be thankful about it. Because we can communicate with two giants in the world. Americans speak English and the Chinese speak Mandarin. And we have it. And on top of that, we speak Bahasa. And our biggest economy in ASEAN is Indonesia. And Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia is highly similar. So, so we've not... got all the advantage we have. So now that you mentioned it, right, the Indonesian capital is moving to um, Kalimantan, Bali, uh, right? Balipapan. Yeah. Balipapan, and then Balipapan, they right? changed the name to Nusantara. Nusantara, right. So the whole sh balance of power in Indonesia shifts eastwards, which is coincidentally or not coincidentally, much nearer to China as well. Well, I would say not much nearer. The one I think is... Big, From Jakarta, uh, no. obviously. Yeah, but, but but if you look at the map of Balipapan... And okay, it's all the way east as well. And you look at the whole Southeast Asia map, Balipapan is in the centre of Southeast Asia. First thing. Second thing, uh, Indonesian changed the word capital to Nusantara. Guys... The old name or historical name for Southeast Asia is Nusantara. Yeah. So they are very clearly putting their stake there and saying us. Well, we, we have to admit, la, first of all, Indonesia got 300, 300 million People. population, yeah. 10 times Malaysia. Second, their economy is the largest in Southeast Asia. They now, they want now, to be the now US Jokowi, of, yeah. Jokowi want to put uh, Indonesia by end of this decade to become the top 10 economy in the world, G10. They might do it. Uh, I think they can do it. They might do right? it, yeah. So, so in that score, Indonesia is the big brother in this region. Mm. Alright? But, we are very fortunate we can speak their language. Absolutely, yeah. So, guys, just imagine. You speak English, you speak Mandarin, you speak Bahasa. I'll share with you one little experience I had. Before COVID, it was 2018. I lead one... Chinese delegate Chengdu from Chengdu. I went to we went to Bali Island. We went to the northern part of Bali Island because they want to uh, build an airport. So the Chinese investor is very interested to look at what opportunity they can they can have. So my contact also con connect me with the deputy governor of Bali Island. So we had a meeting with the government. I'm the translator. They speak English. I translate in Mandarin. And then my, my Chinese counterpart speak Mandarin, I translate in English. Of course, this kind of meeting, you know, they will speak among themselves. So I can hear what the, the Indonesian civil servants are speaking among themselves. Then I I, I, I just say Malay, you know, I say, yeah, yeah, betul, betul. Ini memang uh, motif kita. Both party jump up. They literally <laughs> jump up. The Chinese say, 
罗老师 ，You can speak Bahasa and the Indonesian servant。Awak boleh cakap bahasa Indonesia. Saya boleh cakap, saya boleh faham. Kerana saya dari Malaysia. It's powerful. That is the advantage that being a Malaysian. Another thing, Malaysia is a trading country, and Malaysia is a very open economy. That is what we should capitalize on. That's fantastic, man. Come here. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.